is Emily Mann. I'm the uh, Community Outreach Director for the Southern Oregon Coalition for Racial Equity. Um, and through the work that, like through the work that we've done, um, out at Hawthorne Park serving lunches every day, um, we've really seen the beauty in the unhoused community. Uh, we've gotten really close to a lot of folks that are members of that community. Um, so when this ordinance came up, there was a really quick response. Um, and, and we've definitely made a lot of progress. I think the thing we're all the most proud of is actually centering the voices of the folks that are going to be affected by this ordinance change. Uh, it's been our top priority to get on house folks on the news, doing interviews, um, to get their testimonies submitted um, to city council, because that's really who this is about, right? It's, it's the folks that are unhoused that are going to have their homes taken away. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of this coalition um, and, and how successful we've been in doing that. My name is Murray Richmond. I'm the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church and I'm here because it, people deserve a place to live. We, we started using the term on house because we realized that just because someone doesn't have a house or apartment doesn't mean they, they don't have a home. And for a lot of people their tents are their homes. That's, that provides safety, security. It provides uh, security from the elements. And what this does is it takes away people's homes. And that there may be some problems along the Greenway, but we, we don't solve them. We don't solve them. Excuse me. We don't solve them by just taking away people's homes. If there's a crime wave in a neighborhood, we don't take out all the homes. You know? And so these are people that need a place to live. Maybe we want them to go away, but I'm sorry, away is not a place. People have to be somewhere. And right now they're in their tents, and I just think there's a better way to deal with it than just to say, we're taking away your home. Good evening, everybody. First, I would like us to take time to acknowledge that we are on stolen land that was occupied by the Shasta and the Tekelma. And I ask that we always continue to recognize that this is stolen land and that we need to do like the Native Americans and honor Mother Old and honor all things and be peaceful during this and not let a rise get um, riled out of us and keep this peaceful. So because of restrictions, counselors are not allowed to hear in-person testimony. So we want to open up the mic for any of our unhoused friends who wrote in public testimony but want the counselors to hear what they have to say. Um, so I do, I want to invite any of our unhoused friends that are here tonight that want to speak. Hi, my name is Jenny. I live in a tent at the river, I'm 68 years old. My, the tent saved my life. I was living on the street on a couple of pieces of cardboard at Winco parking lot. And I met somebody I knew from before that I had helped and it went around and come around. And he took me back to his camp. And I believe truly from my heart, it saved my life. We're still there. It's not hard, it is hard. It's not easy, it's a struggle, it's survival. We don't have, of course, hot water, we don't have hot food, we don't have all those things. And, and it's, it's, there's a lot of things that, are, that happen. We've got huge river rats and we've got all sorts of things, but you know what, you can survive it. You take it day by day. Uh, you, uh, you 
hello. I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful people are out here supporting. They're supporting me. They're supporting the people that live there, their homes. They give us some dignity. Don't just take away our tents and like we're, we're just nothing. We, we live there. This, this means everything to us. It's peaceful. We're not on the streets. We're not sleeping in doorways. We're not hassling anybody. We're not hurting everybody. So please don't take away those tents. Don't take away that dignity from us. Don't take away, please don't take away our home. Don't take away my home. And that's what I have to say. Peace out. All right. We got the mic back. Is there anybody else who wants to get up and uh, read the testimony that you emailed to city council? They're only allowed to read if you sent in support or opposition and a brief summary of your email. So if anybody would like them to hear the details of what you wrote. Do you want to read it? Yeah. Prohibiting, this was to Angela Durant, city of Medford. Prohibiting camping ordinance. Criminalizing the homeless is not the solution to help the homeless situation. That will only make things more difficult. I wish people in your position would stop calling this camping. There is nothing rec recreational about being homeless. Who made the call on 25 degree weather to be considered to be cold enough for warming? Do you people even know what it feels like on a consistent day to day, night to night to be cold? It's no party out here, people. Still have obligations, bills, appointments, counseling, or trauma therapy. We are all real everyday people breathing just like you people, but sadly, not in a home. I didn't include, but I would have liked to include, that uh, it's not okay to have a dog chained up in the rain. It is not okay for a dog to be left in the heat. But the city wants to make it okay that an animal is treated much better than we are. It's a crying, screaming shame. Thank you. I also want to let people know we have an altar set up in front of City Hall um, to pay respects to folks that have been lost on the streets of Oregon. We want to send a message to City Council that we won't stand for those things to happen here. That the folks living on the streets of Medford deserve safety and protection from harsh Push weather, from violence. So please take a moment to walk around and take a look at the photos at the altar and take a moment to think about the folks that have been lost. If anybody else wants to come speak, you don't have to have anything prepared. We're happy to hear what's on your heart. To the Medford City Council, I don't know if any of you are Christians, but I know that many, if not most, of the constituents you represent are Christian. So please consider this. When Jesus told the tale of the Good Samaritan, he spoke of a poor soul who was beat up by terrible circumstances and left helpless on the side of the road. The Good Samaritan was the one who found him in need, helped him get on his feet, got him a room in the inn, fed him, cared for him, and restored him. The Good Samaritan most certainly did not try to run the helpless man out of town and cast him into the wilderness. How cold are the hearts of those who would allow such a thing to happen? Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? It said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick, or in prison, and did not help you. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment. Please, Medford City Council, for your own sakes, do not do this terrible thing and pass this unholy ordinance.
Hi, my name is Lynn, and it's my belief that our government, whether it's a city, county, state, or country, the job of our government is to take care of all of us, not just some of us, all of us. Amen. And if they're not doing that, they are failing their job. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brandon. Uh, I too am on the streets. I, I, I camp out uh, what most people know as paradise. Uh, we have been trying to work on the trash. We understand that part. Um, things just kind of got ahead of us in that regard. But uh, I saw this, this, this sign over here that says Proverbs 28, 27, and I wanted to read that because I think it's a powerful message. And I don't think we always do the research in what people are trying to say. And so this is Proverbs uh, chapter 28, verse 27. It says, uh, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. I'm not saying that to try and curse anybody. I'm just trying to say that these are straight from the Bible. I think we can often uh, uh, misinterpret the words to try and, and, and downgrade certain people's human rights. And I, I, I don't think uh, that's what this was intended for. I think this is for protection for the people, for all people, for, for those uh, homeless, for those not homeless, for those persecuted, for those not always persecuted. I, I, think, uh, I think the most important thing that we can do is actually come together as a community uh, and, and, and try to, 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 see, to see our humanity too. We don't we're not trying to uh, present a, a problem. We're trying to, to survive most of the times. And uh, the winters here are hard, I, I think, as a lot of Oregonians know. And uh, summers can be nice, but still to not have a place to go to is, uh, is pretty rough sometimes. And I finally had uh, what I considered at least some, some bit of a, of, a, of a home to go to. And uh, I, just, I just want people to remember that, that's all. So thank you guys. I just recently became homeless. My name's Mutt, for those who want to know. Um, just go to James, go to Leviticus. Um, it's, it's, it's a brand new day, it's God's day. We're all standing here. All you people on the outside too, just remember that you can't own the land, you can't do it. I'm a native and I'm telling you, wait till she shakes like a big dog and we all come off like fleas when there's not so much of us because she's gonna filter us out. But, more importantly for what they're trying to do here. Um, I have one rule in my house and that's just be nice. Um, this isn't nice. Mimi Watsonia, which means water is life. Save water. <laughs> love life. Um, you gotta live it in order to love to live it. Um, wake up and thank God for your, for your, for your life today, and for opening your eyes and for, for, for making you wiggle. And, um, City Council, um, enough from this native. It's really dangerous to ask a pastor up to speak, um, but I've already given taped my sermon for the week, so uh, you know I'm already preached out. But but I, I want to say, God, I believe has gifted every person and made every person in the image of God. That resides in all of us. Now, sometimes that's marred. The other night I was in a meeting and I said something I shouldn't have had that was said carelessly and it hurt somewhat. I'm a marred person. Can I look at someone who is down and out and judge them and say, you don't deserve a home. We're gonna take your home away. Can I look at someone whether they're on drugs or whether they're mentally ill and say, you do not deserve my care and attention. Can this city look at its own residents and say, we're gonna take your homes? This is, I understand there's problems in the Greenway with fires and garbage. There are better ways to deal with that. And I'm sure the people in this building can come up with better ways if they decide to do that instead of trying to take people away, instead of trying to take their homes away. 
I am sure that if we put the creative minds of this community together, we can come up with much better solutions. What they're doing now is like saying there's a crime wave in the neighborhood, so we're going to tear down all the houses. Because they are homes. People who live in tents live in a home. People who live outside have a home. And we're taking their homes away. My good brother spoke previously about Jesus. Jesus comes up and he says, I was hungry and you fed me to a group of people. He said, when, were, when did we feed you? He said, when you fed the least of these, when you fed the hungry person in front of you, you fed me. And he looks at another group of people and said, I was hungry. You didn't feed me. This is Easter weekend. And I'm afraid Jesus is going to look at what we're hap what's happening here and he's, he's going to say, I didn't have a house. So you took my tent. Amen. Uh, basically, I believe that there is good in all of us. And what is happening in there is not the use of the good that we should be doing. And because I, I'm just going <laughs> to. Thanks. This is great, you guys. They deserve to know how their community feels. I think we have a few more folks that want to speak. Anybody who's uh, here is welcome to get up and speak what's on their heart. We want to make sure that everybody's voices are heard. Hi, everybody. Can you hear? I feel so blessed to see you all here today. This is a really nice turnout we've got. Um, I want to speak as a homeowner and a taxpayer. My understanding about being part of this community is that I gladly pay in my taxes because the city government or the state government or the federal government can do things for all of us that I myself cannot do when they combine all of those resources. And I'm depending on the city council to do things in Medford that support good living for all Medfordites, all of us. If I went outside my home and I found 10 unhoused people camping on the sidewalk, I would be upset because my heart would be broken for them and I'd want to help. Not I'd be upset because they ruined the view on my street. And I'd be so glad to pay those taxes and maybe even an extra tax that season to be able to address this issue and help people. Um, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Jew. This is Passover week. We have a commandment, tikkun olam, which is to heal the world. You don't repair the world by pushing unhealed things out of your sight. So I wanna just speak to the heart of everyone and say, you know, we all would like to work hard and keep everything for ourselves, but that's not reality. Reality is I live among you all, and I want you all to be as well as I am so we can live together peacefully. I pray that the city council can understand that what they're doing is just plain mean. That's all. Um, I was out there for four years and got treated like I was lower than low. Um, they made me move once if not twice a week because I was a drug user and I had nothing in life. They act like anybody out there is homeless is nothing. They treat us as if we're dirt, we're just junkies and nobody's ever going to change but we're all worth something. I've got a lot of family and friends out there that are still going through it, and I would love to see something change. Um, I got the chance to change, and here I am now with my kids. So if we could do something to help these people and get them off the streets or help them get the help that they need to stay where they are to exceed in life, that would be great. My name is Zachary Blake. I, oh, shit. Oh, yeah, I'm tall. That's right. 
Um, hi, my name is Zachary Blake. I've lived in Oregon my entire life, and I've seen a lot of folks come out and speak about how this is wrong in the name of their religion. I'm someone who is not Christian myself, but I'm a Norse pagan, and I've spent my life studying other, other religions. And I have yet to find a religion that, that has said, oh, you're poor, you're cold, you're hungry, you're alone, go die. In my religion, it teaches us that every day, the All Father walks the world seeking knowledge. And every time that I, I drive through downtown Medford, I always wonder with each face, is that a friend from high school? Is that a stranger? Is that my God? Is that just someone who fell on bad times? And I can't physically bring myself to look at that and go, yeah, they deserve it. The, these people are people. They don't, the two people in my life that gave me the most inspiration to change who I am was my best friend who I'm here with. When, when I was 13 years old, I was walking home from the school bus. And an older homeless man asked for some money. I gave him $5. I ended up talking with that man for two hours. Scared the hell out of my family when I showed up late. I have never met such compassion, such true love, care for his, his fellow man. And these people who are trying to pass this law, they don't seem to see that. They don't see them as human. They see them as a weed, as garbage. How can you say you represent the, the people of this city, of Oregon? How can you say that you care when, when you can look at another human being and go, I think you are worth less. I know Medford is better. I know Oregon is better than that. We have a history of coming together to stand up for what's right. And our homeless population should know that they aren't separate from that and that they deserve to be a part of us because they are a part of the community and they always will be. Hello, uh, my name is Jaden, and um, I wanted to let y'all know, I know I'm super grateful that y'all have showed up here to support with our house and unhoused friends and uh, to let the city of Medford know that uh, creating a law to further prohibit people from simply existing is just like pure uh, heartless insanity and I want y'all to know, I wanted to give y'all a little uh, perspective about the shelter options that we do have in Medford. So in Medford, there are three official recognized shelters. There's the Kelly Shelter, there's Hope Village, and the Urban Campground, which only came about last year. I wanted y'all to know that for multiple years, the Hope Village and Kelly Shelter have had a very long wait list. It's been, I have sent multiple 15 plus emails to Liz of Rogue Retreat to get further numbers, but she has declined, so the, the most recent numbers I have were in December. Uh, Hope Village had 180 people on their wait list. Kelly Shelter had 336 on their wait list. Uh, the only other shelter, which is the urban campground. Uh, the problem with the urban campground is the only way to get into the urban campground is through a referral through a police officer. Now the police officers have continuously harassed, targeted, ticketed, swept, raided our unhoused friends camps. So why on earth would they feel comfortable to go talk to people who have continuously criminalized them, yes. harassed them, and like, uh, so those are, those are our three shelter options. And the city of Medford isn't legally required to say that all of these shelter options are full or all of these shelter options, they, they, they're, they're welcome to say how many spots they think they have. They, they don't have to legally say how many there are. So I want y'all to know with this ordinance uh, that they're voting on right now, folks have literally nowhere to go. There are a total of seven DDOX beds overall. There are also uh, the one, uh, like outpatient program, sorry, inpatient program uh, is extremely inaccessible and not low barrier. You have to attend multiple Zoom, meeting, Zoom meetings a week in order to get into the inpatient program. Uh, it's literally like, ha it, it, <laughs> there's not Wi-Fi, like, you know, access to computers, phones, whatever. It's, it's incredibly inaccessible. I'd also like to mention there's been a large, uh, a lot of people who have been supporting this are talking about the trash on the Greenway. And I would like you to know that 
the amount of times that we, like, f folks clean up their trash. A lot of folks do clean up their trash. The city of Medford has specifically denied folks trash bags and trash service. I have talked to Kelly Madding multiple times. She always says she's interested in getting a program together, and that has not happened. The city of Medford lets this trash exist on the Greenway because they, they treat it as political theater, as, as, as you have seen, because they always talk about how there's so much trash on the Greenway. Well. Every human creates trash. Every human uses, needs to use the restroom. There has been one open, one, one open restroom, public restroom in all of downtown Medford for the majority of the pandemic. I just want that to like sit with y'all. Like that is, excuse my language, but so fucked. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to read, so we recently did a survey with, um, uh, it was a total of 40 folks uh, living throughout Medford uh, on the streets along the Greenway, and I just wanted to read some of these statistics for y'all. So of those 40 people, 80% have lived in Southern Oregon for five years or more, 50% have disabilities, 32% were displaced by the wildfires that happened in September, 92% of people said not having a tent would put them in danger of, during the extreme weather. And as you know, here in Southern Oregon, the summers are extremely hot and the winters are extremely cold. Side note, Medford did not open a warming shelter this winter. Uh, community members did. They created Judy's uh, a mobile pop-up, which they're over there. Give them some love. Um, also, that 80% uh, said not having a tent would make it harder to access services. 82% of those people said not having a tent would impact their physical safety, including the risk of sexual violence. Um, there's more, but I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, it has been so uh, inspiring and beautiful to see the community come together, but also so heartbreaking to know that the people behind us, the majority of the people behind us who are voting on this, just are so detached from reality and so detached from the idea of wanting to help people. And, and we need to be here and support our, our friends because we are, like, if, if they want, we are not going anywhere and we're gonna make sure that whatever happens, that we can help them as much as they can, stay safe. Um, people are not, camping everybody people are simply surviving a camping experience is like going to like you know and uh, going out in your car it's a privilege to go camp and the way the city council has painted it is is of that a lot of these folks don't have other options there are the resources in medford are so bare and so dry and the resources themselves a lot do not want to admit that but we need to continue to push the city of Medford. We need to conti continue to fight the city of Medford to make sure that our unhoused friends are seen and respected as the human beings that they are. Um, yeah, that's what I want to say. And I also, I just want to give a, a big shout out to these rad folks who are blocking um, this ridiculous, disgusting sign. So thank you all for doing that. Hi everyone. Hi, uh, my name's Dominique. I am the research director for So Equity. And about four years ago, I was homeless. Um, I hate it when I hear people say that, oh, the homeless don't want to work. <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, I was on my way to a job interview on my bike. I got hit by a car. Instead of going to a hospital, I still went to the interview. Hashtag millennial. So only to find out after the interview was over, they basically didn't want to hire me because they wanted a permanent housekeeper and I had way too many college credits. So, <laughs> um, when I tried looking for housing, first place that I went to was Rogue Retreat. And of course the waiting list was super long. So, 
I ended up sleeping in a tent in someone's backyard. <laughs> um, continued to look for work. But when you have, when you're too overly qualified, nobody wants to hire you. But at the same time, it's like, <laughs> and then before that, I was going to school. I was working full time. And then what happens is there's this uh, special little rule when it comes to FAFSA. If you're under the age of 24 and your parents don't sign the information, if they don't send their tax info to the government, you can't go to school. My mom was an alcoholic. She was irresponsible. Every month I would call her and beg her to send in her tax information so I could continue going. She wouldn't do it. So I lost the funding that I needed to continue going to school. Um, so a way around that is if I get married or I have a dependent. So after some spiraling depression and binge drinking three months later, I got pregnant. And then next thing I know, I get the funding that I needed to go to school, but I still didn't have housing. And then as it turns out, there was only one place that I even barely made the qualifications to get into. It was a group home for pregnant or parenting teen girls. I was 21 at the time. When the mom's program collapsed, the group home that I was in made an exception that year specifically to allow in older girls. And I was one of the first ones. The interesting part about that is what the, the people in charge of you like to tell you is that if it wasn't for them, you'd be sleeping under a bridge. And then when they go home to their homes, they vote for the people that continue to make it hard to get housing. the amount of white savior complex that I've had to go through in order to even get to this point. There were some programs, they told me that I didn't qualify because I didn't have a drug problem. And I'm like, isn't that supposed to be a good thing? <laughs> but I believe that housing is a human right I'm from Baltimore City, Maryland. I had members in my family that did struggle with drug addiction. I worked at the VA when I came out here when I was in high school. I have seen some things. I didn't think any less of them. I didn't think that they deserved to be thrown away. So why create programs with so many barriers to the point where they influence that you should get a drug problem and then you can get housing? Makes no sense. I was so upset because after I had my son, then that's when the stereotypes really start to come out I'm black, I'm a single parent. Obviously, I must be a welfare queen, right? A certification program that originally takes two years to finish, I finished in nine months. I worked my ass off. I have not met a single person that has not worked their ass off to get up from poverty. The thing is, you gotta work 10 times as fucking hard. 
Sometimes, a lot of us don't have a support system. So what are we left with, man? When I was working, was I not a taxpayer? So when it is that I'm down on my luck, where the hell was the help at that, that my tax dollar so-called paid for? Is this what the hell it paid for? One thing that I'm tired of is people that own their homes and live in a posh neighborhood that get into positions like this that have the audacity to speak on issues they know nothing about. I'm so sick of it. Not one of these people know what it's like to sleep in a tent, not for recreation, but for literal survival. You don't know what that's like. Did you ever grow up in a household where you had people struggling with addiction and you had to grow up just earlier than the rest of your counterparts around you just to make something of yourself only to then be knocked down five steps back and then double time work extra hard with the baby to make it to where the hell you are today? Before this pandemic, after I graduated from RCC, I worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. But people still thought that I was a stereotype. Then when the pandemic hit and I lost my daycare, I was right back at square one, I thought. So that's why it pisses me off when people that have never been in this situation want to speak on a situation they've never been in. You don't know their story. Why are you judging them? In spite of the few good-hearted Christians that have come up here and spoken, I couldn't help but notice the overwhelming amount of the other that want to judge the hell out of you. I don't think I've ever been told by a Satanist ever that I'm going to hell. But I can name quite a few Christians that told me that. Like hate. I know, right? Like and it's kind of interesting with that man over there holding that super bigoted sign. I mean, I kept the baby. I'm still pro-choice, though. I want to read some testimony that um, Maria or better known as Mama Bear, to us and our unhoused friends, has submitted to city council that unfortunately will not be read in its entirety tonight, so I want to read it for all of you. So Maria said to city council, my name's Maria Garalaga. I'm a Native American and African American. We see firsthand how this is affecting mental health for the unhoused. I've lived in Medford for many years, and I spend my days working with the unhoused community here. I have many concerns about the current proposed ordinance. Criminalizing poverty and homelessness will do nothing but make people scared and desperate. The crime rate will go up, drug use will go up, and mental health and addiction services will become much more difficult to access. People will be exposed to severe weather. Hypothermia cases will overload the hospitals in the winter and heat stroke in the summer. People choke on wildfire and cannot escape from the health repercussions. There is not enough space in the shelters for everyone that would be displaced by this ordinance. Where are they supposed to go? They can't even use public bathrooms right now. What will they do when they can no longer camp in our city? This is so heartbreaking to realize that some of you and some people from the community are heartless enough human beings that you would want to pass something like this. I can tell that the people wanting to pass this have never been in such a position. And you're lucky enough to not have experienced homelessness. Please, really think about what you're about to do and have a heart. Let's work on real solutions for the unhoused. I want to offer my opinion on some solutions to the housing problem in Medford. First of all, we need more affordable housing. Housing should be the first line of defense against homelessness, not the last. 
We need integrated health care that's accessible for everybody experiencing a crisis. We need to invest more money in career programs to build pathways to work while fostering education connections and affordable tuition plans. If we can strengthen our crisis response models and lean less on police interaction and more on mental health care, we can lighten the load on the criminal justice system and keep more people out of the endless cycle of incarceration. As we build partnerships throughout the city, we can collectively solve the problem and prevent homelessness in Medford together. Thank you. T-Bone. Hey everybody. First of all, I wanna say thank you for everyone coming out. Um, I'm T-Bone. I am currently homeless myself. I live down on the Greenway, um, or shall I say I survived down on the Greenway. Um, they like to say it's a no camping ordinance, which me growing up, I was always under the understanding that camping was fun. Well, guess what? This ain't fucking fun. Trying to get by every single day, it's not fun. It's stressful enough just being homeless. It is a hard struggle and a hard fight every day being homeless. But happening to constantly worry about running from the cops or trying to hide out from the cops because, you know, I got a pocket full of dope, but because I have a tent, you're gonna take me to jail. How, does that, how is there any logic in that? There is none. Law enforcement's supposed to be developing relations with um, those of us when they do their outreach and so on and so forth. I recently had an experience where um, I, was said, I was threatened by a specific police officer. He informed me when this ordinance passes, and it will, your camp is the first one that's going to get bulldozed and you're the first one going to jail. Okay, I'll be here waiting. And um, I can't wait for them to show up. Because, boy, have I got a nice little surprise for them. <laughs> um, I've done quite a few interviews about this, this whole topic. Um, I used to be a very quiet, keep to myself kind of person. You know, maintain a low profile, stay out of line of sight, don't piss off the neighbors. So that's what I went by. This came up, it was brought to my attention, and I realized that I can't vote. I technically, I cannot vote, but I can still have a voice. Each and every one of us can still have a voice. Each and every one of us can stand up for what we know to be right. I speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. We are sick of this. We are tired of being bullied. We're tired of being lied to and told, utilize the resources. Utilize the res What resources? There are none. But they're going to continue to try to bully and scare and punk you into going out to the urban campground or one of the other shelters. I'm not doing it. I'm gonna fight to the very end. And if that means I gotta go to jail, well then bring on the handcuffs because I'm ready to go. struggle at all so I decided oh I'm gonna go to these shelters and I'm gonna show all these people on the greenway that we can make it 
and I had some really bad experiences. This is my Harley Quinn. She's my service animal. She's specifically trained to perform a task, and that she does. So it's intimidating that, you know, they're saying we can't have a tent or they don't want us to have a tent, but then they have these things for dogs, you know. You can't have a dog in the rain. You can't have a dog in the hot sun. Okay. So I go to the shelter and I take my Harley Quinn. We went to the Kelly shelter. And I was like, oh, this looks kind of all right. This is, looks like it, that I could do this. But really, I didn't want to because I don't like to be that close to people. I'm not trying to make friends. I don't want to be out of Club Med, so to speak. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there was this uh, giant uh, poodle, a giant poodle there at the very far end of all the bunks. And uh, COVID had, you know, land on us unexpectedly, everybody. And then there was an outbreak, or not an outbreak, but somebody had COVID. They wouldn't tell anyone who had COVID. So we're all quarantined on lockdown. And that's another thing. That shelter couldn't, couldn't, couldn't socially distance anybody. And they were double-minded and friendly with people that they had problems telling people to distance. You know, that's, that's, they shouldn't have had that. The people in those seats of position shouldn't have been there. So then as they say, okay, well, we're going to have an outing, a group outing, and we're going to go to the Crown Market down the way over there. So we go to the Crown Market. I'm out of register, and this other guy's out of register with uh, the, the giant um, poodle. And uh, I'm paying the guy at the register, and the giant poodle attacks Harley Quinn while I'm making a payment. And the dog jumped or moved from the register over on the far side over here and got Harley Quinn. Well, when we came out of the store, the guy's, oh, I'm so sorry, is your dog all right? Yeah, my dog's fine. This kind of thing can happen. Let's just keep our dogs separated. So uh, we were sitting on our bunks, and uh, Harley Quinn just jumped up out of nowhere, and I'm like, what's going on? And then this guy's looking from his top bunk, and I'm looking, and it's the dog passing by. And I had already asked him if he can walk his dog on the opposite side uh, so that uh, we don't have that uh, problem again. Uh, and his mannerisms at the end of the other end of the leash were very saddening because he said, I will walk my dog wherever I want to walk my dog. So I knew there could be eventually be a problem. So I went and took it to the, uh, to the staff. Uh, they don't want to call the police. They want to try to work everything out there. So I was like, okay, let's try this. And that didn't happen. Uh, I tried to say, okay, well, look, can, can I take my dog out poop when she goes poop in the middle of the night? Can somebody please take it to the dumpster out in the back so I don't have to cross that, that way? Nobody could say yes or no. And so the lady that was in charge there said, I'll tell you this. If it happens again, you both can leave. So I packed up my stuff and I took my service dog out because we're not taking any chances. That stuff is expensive. I wouldn't be homeless right now if the building where I was living wasn't a sick building. And so you people that own that property, you just keep in mind that a sick building syndrome doesn't have any favorites. Everybody gets sick from sick building syndrome. And how dare you not clean up your building? Thank you, everybody. All right, I just, um, I just wanted to say this. Uh, in just a few minutes, the city council meeting will start. When they start this meeting, as they do all of their meetings, they're going to have a prayer. They're going to pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ. And then, and then they're going to vote. And they're going to vote to put innocent people who have done no wrong in a jail cell, in a diseased cage where they will be traumatized for six months then a thousand dollar fine then a misdemeanor on their record for the rest of their lives and i'd like to remind you what the crime that they committed for all of this punishment was sleeping 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 guys so I, I just want everybody to please pressure these individuals. Clearly, they are believers. And if they're believers in the word of Christ, I'd like to remind everybody what Jesus said. Somebody asked him, how do we get to heaven? Jesus said it easy. He said, love one another as you loved me. 
I'll see you there. Well, that's how we get to heaven, guys. We have to love one another. Putting people in prison is the antithesis of love. It is the antithesis of Christ. Show some love. Thank you, guys. So city council meeting is just about to start. This conversation is pretty far down on the agenda, so we want to continue to open up the mic for folks to speak until we get close to that time, and then we'll be tuning in. Um, I do want to let folks know that we've got Judy's Midnight Diner here. They've got water. They've got food. They've got hot drinks. This is job. what community looks you like, doing? you guys. When the city doesn't step up to provide, we take care of ours. I also want to point everybody to a couple of social media accounts that have been really, really clutch in getting the word out there. Uh, Rise and Resist Southern Oregon and Siskiyou Street News are two awesome accounts. I want to encourage everybody to follow on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date because their fight is not over after tonight. <laughs> So just wanted to point out the uh, Herbal Alliance is over here. They have uh, herbal hot cocoa, uh, eye masks, face masks, chapstick, sorry, not eye masks, face masks, and chapstick, um, along with Judy. So burritos for all if you're hungry. Hello, can you hear me? I have lost my voice, so I cannot speak very loud. Trust me, it is not the Rona. But <laughs> what I would like to say, first off, is one of my favorite quotes that I've ever heard in my life. It touched me deeply. By Pope John Paul II. And he said, that mankind will never be completely fulfilled until it learns to give itself to others completely. That, that is the antithesis of this whole thing right now. You know, you stay camping, I say, I need to live, I need to be able to survive. I'm a human, you know, you want to just take me and throw me in the cold and expect me to live? I mean, this is America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't feel free, and if I start to be brave, these mofos are gonna take me to jail. So, this is what I gotta say. Plain and simple, we're surviving, I'm one with you, you are one with me. We love you guys. Hey all, uh, my name is Spencer. I grew up in uh, Medford here. I went to North Medford High School. And uh, when I was there, I took a government class. And I wanna remind uh, the city councilors and everyone here about the responsibility the government has to its people. That that our constitution is based on this idea of, of the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And that comes from, from John Locke's treatise on government saying that we separate ourselves from the law of nature. We separate ourselves from survival, from killing each other for food, and we take care of each other. That we all, every single person in this country, and hopefully in this world someday, has a right to life, to liberty, and John Locke says to property. And now, if I'm walking through the park and I, I drop my wallet, that's still my property, right? Now, if, if I have to walk away from my backpack, that's still my property, right? So why is it that the police believe that they can steal the property of our houseless neighbors when they're away from their sites? Why is it that they believe they can chase them, take their tents, their homes, their backpacks, the tools they're using to survive? So. And that's just one of the many things that the, these city councilors have a responsibility to. But as you've heard tonight, these councilors are so far out of touch with their responsibility, combining church and state and, and not respecting the basic human rights that we all have. So what I'd like to remind everyone to do is to look up your city council person's name. Remember their name and remember that name when you vote. Um, I just wanted to share an experience that I had um, last summer. 
So I had just recently learned about this urban campground. I know it was open before then, but I, you know, wasn't very keen to, you know, privy to this information. And I live right around here, so I was walking my dogs after um, a big, a huge rainstorm um, in the park. And I met a man that had just gotten out of prison just that night, like two hours before. He had been in for two years. His leg was broken. He didn't have, you know, anything. He didn't have crutches. He didn't have a cast or anything. He just had a boot, um, which was soaked. All of his clothes were completely soaked from the rain. Um, and so I had mentioned the urban campground, you know, not knowing anything about it. And he said, well, I just don't feel safe there. I feel like I would have to sleep with one eye open. And I said, okay, I understand that. Um, also, me not knowing anything about the shelter situation, I walked him over to the shelter that's just across the street here. And they said, well, you have to be added to the wait list in order to stay here. And I said, is there anything you can do for him? He doesn't have anything. He just got out of jail. I mean, his clothes are soaking wet. He's miserable. And they said, well, we'll give him a sleeping bag. So they gave him a sleeping bag and sent him on his way. I, you know, being a small girl, didn't have any clothes that I could give him that would fit. And I felt horrible that there was nothing else that I could do for him. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to light that when, you know, obviously circumstances that they can't predict happen, they have nothing, they have no one, no help at all. And, you know, for someone like me who doesn't have any resources to give them, it feels horrible to not be able to help them. So they need to help them in ways that we can't as individual civilians. All right, my name is Kayla Wade. I'm the logistics director for So Equity. The Medford City Council has put forward this ordinance that would essentially make it illegal to exist on the Greenway if you're houseless. They're calling it a camping or ordinance and they're trying to specifically ban tents from existing there. And this is just a specific um, targeted effort to, to criminalize our houseless friends and to make it illegal to simply survive. Um, it's a complete 180 from just this time a year ago when they encouraged folks to stay and shelter in place on the Greenway because of the pandemic that we're still in and uh, because for whatever reason, for whatever reason they have decided to, um, to make this decision to completely attack and criminalize our houseless friends. I'm Keziah Anderson. I'm the head police liaison at SO Equity. This event here to me is basically one of our many attempts to get the city of Medford to realize that uh, unhoused aren't criminals. They're just trying to survive. And what we're trying to get the city to realize is that they just need a place to sleep. But the city keeps trying to find any and every reason to keep their foot down on them so they have someone to, de to criminalize whenever they feel the need to criminalize people, which, in my opinion, is just disgusting. was a guy that used to come by our church a lot and um, Aaron had a, a series of mental illnesses I'm not sure what they all were um, but what happens to him is that first of all he just looks like a victim and people go after him secondly his behavior is sometimes uncontrollable never violent never abusive but like he would cry for no reason at all or, or things like that and when he came to our food bank I'd push his cart through and and he would just be behind, so oh, thank you, brother, and then he'd be crying. And and um, there are a lot of people that he he irritated um, because he had a mental illness. And unfortunately, he was found killed, murdered on the Greenway this last week. This last week, and um, we're going to try to get together a group of people at our church and do a service for him. But he's he's one of God's children, and he's really going to be missed. Um, Kelly was the person who, I did not know Kelly, but he's one of the reasons that we have the Kelly Shelter. It's named after him. 
uh, he died of exposure out on the streets and a group of people said we shouldn't do this anymore and um, so yeah